announcements before we begin? Could you all please turn off your cell phones or put them on airplane mode? Uh, also, uh, if anyone has lost, uh, I know this only apply to a certain group of our members, but uh, if anyone's lost an earring, uh, <laughs> it's gold and it's round and it's right up here on the desk. So if you've lost an earring, uh, if you would come up after the meeting, Herman, you lost an earring, uh, uh, it'll be right up here. Uh, I've also been asked to tell you that there are an abundance of donuts. So you're free to go back and get another donut and uh, liquidate our inventory. And with that, we're going to talk about uh, computer club uh, matters, community matters, and our presentation and our financial report. Financial report is very much like you saw it <coughs> uh, last month. Uh, I'm going to make a, just a brief explanation of some things there. Uh, I've been approached, and a lot of other people have, on rumors that we are moving the uh, computer lab. And uh, that is a very distinct possibility, but it is far from an accomplishment. There's a lot of work to be done yet. And no one has approved anything in terms of formality. So we're very, very preliminary stages, and trust me, these things move real slow. Uh, we've been working on this from the fall, basically. And that's the reason that we've held back on not spending some of the funds that you all approved for particular pieces of equipment. Because until we understood what we were doing, we wanted to hold that money in abeyance make sure we married up the equipment with whatever we ended up with as far as a new facility. So again, this is not, uh, not this is a very, very preliminary thing. It's gonna take months. Uh, it may not come about at all, but uh, I did want to squelch some of the rumors that uh, seem to be floating around and catching up with everybody. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for the donations. The, uh, oh. I'd like to, hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody for their contributions to the Grafton Food Pantry. Uh, I know we live in a, you know, collectively McHenry, Kane County, or affluent areas, but there's still a lot of problems, and there's still a lot of people who are very much in need of a little hands up now and then. So. Thank you very much for your assistance on that. I don't know what to say about this, but uh, uh, last uh, July we hit over 1,700, and we're approaching that now in February. Um, all I can say is there are a lot of computers out there that need repair, um, and, and I. Uh, that's about all I can say. I did want to make one announcement that's related to that a little bit. And, and you, can be, you can be ambassadors for this. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, talk to your enemies. Uh, tell them to please, if somebody calls on a phone to fix their computer, hang the phone up. We're getting more and more problems coming in to the lab that there was probably nothing wrong with those computers until somebody allowed somebody to call them on the telephone to start screwing around with them. And we really would appreciate it if all of us would take that point and get it across to people that when people call you on the telephone, just hang up. Don't, don't even listen to them. So uh, that's something that's important, I think, uh, right now. George. Yes. There's a new one where they pop something up on the screen and say, call this number. Uh, and a lot of people are getting that one too. Yeah. And Ken would point out, uh, there is another one, and I've seen that, where something pops up on your screen and says, call this number. Don't. And uh, uh, I, it's one of I know if you can correct me, if you click that off, it won't, it won't hurt you, I don't think. It, it's not, it hasn't hurt the computer, but it's just I know. scaring you. Right, right. And so, uh, but if anybody, if anybody volunteers, you know, 
I won't say this is a bad world out there, but uh, be real suspicious of people other than in your club. Not too much. Be real suspicious of anybody but someone in your club that offers to help you. Real suspicious. Okay, the winter classes are here. The ones, uh, well, the ones coming up in February. There is a change. There was a class scheduled for Wednesday, the, uh, the 11th, I believe it was, um, <clears throat> on Yahoo and Google Finance and managing your finances using those tools. Uh, that class has, class has been canceled and rescheduled for uh, the 25th of uh, February. So it's, it's simply moved out two weeks. The class will go on and whatever, it'll be, it will be out two weeks. An announcement will be made uh, Monday uh, on a blast and we have it posted on all of our um, bulletin boards and what have you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, uh, computer club. It's <laughs> not <laughs> much better, George. <laughs> computer club issues. We need a little help. And if you can, uh, if you happen to have uh, a tape player for the, these M120 tapes, these are small tapes, uh, a camera, uh, and you're, you're not using it, you don't want to use it, please bring it into the lab. It would be very helpful. And the same is with these M60 tapes, which are smaller tapes. If you have any of those, if you could bring those into the lab, that would also Not be. Not the tapes, the player. Oh, I'm sorry, the player. That's a little dictator, the, the dictator type uh, player. Dictation type player. Okay, again, a newsletter is coming out on schedules. Uh, if you have any input for that newsletter, please send it to Bob Markham. Community Matters, Board of Directors uh, uh, meeting will be on uh, Wednesday 218 and the, the COW meeting will be on March 4. Uh, the reason we're announcing March 4 in February is because our next meeting is after that in March. So uh, at any rate, you're, you're willing, you're, you're uh, welcome to attend either of those meetings. Uh, there has been a change in policy. There's been a change in policy uh, from CAM and the previous, uh, well, for some time now, you've been able to enroll in some of the drop-in classes, the lifelong learning classes, uh, fitness classes, things of that nature, uh, that they just walk up, sign in, pay your money, and you're all set. Uh, there's been a change on that. They no longer accept walk-ins. You'll have to pre-register, well, either pre-register or you have to, if you want to register the day of the event, you have to go to the CAM desk and register for that. Um, also, uh, the policy in the past has been that uh, the fitness programs, all the classes essentially, follow the high school agenda and that's been changed that now classes will only be canceled if the lodge itself is closed. And that's usually sent out by a blast. It would be on the, on the uh, website, uh, so you'd have to pay attention to that. We talked about this last week, uh, last month a little bit, but now it's real. We have, uh, before we talked that it was coming, that we're gonna have some recycling bins. Uh, they're in the, in the various rooms now. Uh, please use them. Uh, you can see at the bottom what is, is acceptable in there. And essentially, it's all the recyclable things that you would normally think of, uh, just not greasy, dirty things. Oh, and no styrofoam cups. Uh, as all of you know, uh, Jim Van Cleet, passed away. Uh, he was a board member. Uh, he had term, a time on his term to be served. So the board is now seeking a replacement for, uh, for Jim's term. 
if you're interested in running for the board, it's not really running for the board, it'd be a series of interviews, but if you would go to the website and download a application letter, uh, or you can get it at the CAM desk, and submit that by February 20 to uh, Lauren's office. That would require a little background or resume, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if you would do that, you would be considered for that board position. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Jeff Stipe. Jeff is leading our uh, SIG group in photography. And he's got an excellent presentation on showing you how to do better in your photographic efforts. is the ability to take the picture you see. Um, more often than not, you, you, you'll see an image, you'll shoot the picture, when you, get the, when you look at it later on, it's not what, not what you saw. Um, the camera doesn't do as good a job of seeing the picture as you do without some manipulation on your part. What I'd like to do is a review of the features of the camera and the features of the software that we have control over that would allow us to get that picture uh, that, that we see. Also, I want to take a brief look at some of the software that's available um, commercially as well as in our lab that allows us to uh, work with that picture. The whole intent of the photography club is simply to make you a more successful photographer. Um, but first, what I'd like to start with is just a a little review of <clears throat> how we got to this point, or in any case, how I got to this point, and uh, I, I'm really quite new at this, I only got started when I retired in July of 2012. Um, but of the 16 currently active members in the computer club, we all pretty much came through the same route. Um, you know, we're old enough that we all started with the, bo with the brownie box camera. Um, from there, uh, I always had access to my dad's uh, Kodak 35, could never get a good picture with it, but kept fooling around with it, so moved to an Instamatic, which was fine. Then, of course, you're always anxious to, tired of waiting for the developer and want to see it, so I moved to a Polaroid. And then finally, I got my first uh, real 35 millimeter. Uh, my publisher gave it to me because we're going on a trip out west and said, try and take some decent pictures. Well, it didn't, didn't happen. Uh, we moved here about seven months ago, so I'm well aware that, that I have three boxes, <laughs> big boxes, of photos. And uh, it's the kind of thing where every year we promise we're going to go through them and pick them out. Uh, I went through them the other day and found one from the Brownie and one from the Instamatic and, and one successful shot from the old Kodak on the Polaroid. And then, of course, there's those six or seven boxes of 100 slide rotary trays from the, the slide projector that uh, sitting around, not, not sure what to do with those. Today's point-and-shoot cameras, what we refer to as point-and-shoot, have become very, very sophisticated. They have actually have manual controls on them. They have the ability not just to let the camera do the work, but for you to make some setting changes that would do a better job of getting the picture that you would like to take. Uh, and, and, you know, they aren't <coughs> unreasonably priced. The, the, only problem I, the only problem I find with this camera is you're looking at that, that little view window. And uh, sometimes it's hard to see. I found that with, with a point and shoot, uh, what works best for me is always wear a baseball hat because I can get the, kind of get the, the bill over it and, and see, the, see the image a little bit better. If you want to go a step up, then we're looking at entry level uh, digital single lens reflex cameras. And uh, these, are, these are rough prices, but the, these are prices that also include two lenses. So you've got your, what they call your kit lens, or the basic lens that comes with a camera, which gives you a, a, usually an, an 18 to 55 focal length. And then if you want to reach out longer to be able to get more, you can get a telephoto lens with them. Uh, so they're not unreasonably priced. They're available. Um, 
the, the folks in the, in, the, in the camera photo group at this point have a mix of both, the point and shoot as well as, as this. So then the question becomes, you know, what, what camera do you use or what do you want? Um, like I said, when I retired in 12, my wife bought me an entry level uh, DSLR. And it's a great camera, and I use that when I want to try and take some serious pictures. I have my old um, Canon PowerShot, which is a nice size camera, has nice controls on it, and it's great to take to school plays for the grandkids, the sporting events. If not, I'm not hauling around this big camera. I've got a nice little compact camera. And then, of course, I've got my uh, little pocket camera, which I always take fishing. Um, and I've learned to always put it in my pocket. Um, one of the things that I've, I've discovered is usually when you see that great picture, you don't have your camera. I mean, this summer being, I'm coming out of Walmart and stepped out into the parking lot to get in the car, and there's the sky and the clouds, and it looked like there was an actual silver edge on the clouds. One of the most stunning clouds pictures I've ever seen. And I'm standing there saying, geez, would have been nice if I put my camera in my pocket. Uh, so the advantage of something small like that is you, you, you can carry it with you, learn to carry it with you. I'm not a big cell phone person, but the new cell phones, uh, smartphones have excellent camera capabilities. Um, and I've just recently realized that if you have a, uh, an iPhone with the, the newer operating system, that there's a, uh, an application out there called Pro Camera 8, which gives you almost full manual control over the camera in that in that iPhone. You can set shutter speed, you can set all kinds of settings in respect to it. Uh, so that they're getting more and more advanced. You can't talk about cameras and not talk about photo storage. At least not digital cameras and talk about photo storage. Uh, the SD cards or the secure digital card. Now one of the most important things that we found to understand about the cards is not just the size, you know, 8 gigabytes versus 16 gigabytes. And we always take our pictures in the finest resolution. I mean, most of these cameras have the ability to take everything from a medium or low resolution up to a real high resolution picture. There's no reason not to go to the high resolution because you have storage capabilities. For example, just on an 8 gig card, you can put 800 photos in the high resolution. If you go to a 16, you can put roughly 1,600 photos. And just because one is smaller in capacity the other doesn't mean it's storing any less, uh, an image of less quality. They're the same quality. The issue or what you're looking for on these guys, and if you take a look at the, uh, if, I can point to it. if you take a look to that number right there and that number right there, uh, the four and the 10, the class of the card, what that relates to is how fast the card will store the image. So if you buy a card that has a four, and you're out at your grandkids' soccer game, you're not gonna possibly be able to take the pictures as fast as you'd like to be able to. The action's moving down the field and you wanna take multiple pictures, it's gonna take that card a little longer to store that image. So in that situation, you're probably better off looking at a, a higher class card, you know, maybe a six, maybe a 10, something where the recording speed is quicker so you can get those, those shots. All right, so now we're in the digital realm we no longer have this issue of, you know, limited photographs and then what the old 24 roll of film, the 35 roll of film, and you had to, boy, look, look for just the right shot because what was gonna happen is you got one shot and you don't know until after the fact whether it turned out any good. But with the digital, now you can just take tons of pictures. Um, and so the question, is more pictures really better? So what you wind up with is you saw that field of great wildflowers and you took a whole boatload of pictures and now you've got them all and now you're going to have to go through all of them and find the one good one. What we refer to that is, is opportunistic shooting. Here's a, here's a shot I want, I'm going to try and take the opportunity and just to make sure I get something good, I'm going to take a whole bunch of them and then you come back and you're going to spend quite a bit of time going through and trying to find the best one of the group. And hopefully, I think George will support this, hopefully you clear out all the bad ones. Otherwise your hard drive or your card starts to fill up and you've got all this, this garbage on it and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So, once we get 
tired of the opportunistic shooting, sorting through all those things. Then the typical next step is to move, because of the manual controls, to what's called the scene mode of the camera. And we discovered, shoot, this thing's got some built-in settings for us. Um, what these settings do is they simply pre-assign values. We're going to talk about a little bit later. Shutter speed, aperture, sensitivity of the lens, this thing called white balance. But these settings are made for a typical landscape, portrait, child, sports, macro phase. And by turning to one of those, what you've done now is you've got a custom setting of some of the features in the camera that will actually get you closer to getting the picture you want or the picture you see without having to take so many pictures to try and find that or hopefully that you lucked out and, and got it. It's at this point in the game where I think everybody in the current photo group has said, you know, we would really like to be able to do a little bit of this ourselves. We'd like to take a little more control over our camera and be able to do some things to get the pictures the way we see them or to get them to look the way we want them to look. And that's where the PhotoSync comes in. It's a group of your fellow computer club members. Um, we have one person in there who's a professional photographer, but everybody else is a rank amateur, uh, just like myself. And what we're doing is simply working together to try and improve these abilities and to learn how to use the features to come with our cameras. So what I want to start off looking at is the modes and settings of the camera, just to give you an idea of what we do in the photo sync, the type of things we're looking at. Um, we start with looking at the actual features of the cameras. What are these things that we can adjust? Just because we can adjust them doesn't mean we're going to get a better picture, but it means that we can start to do some things, and over time, like anything else, we practice and practice and practice, you start to get a feel for what you want. So we start with shutter speed. Now, what is really nice about today's cameras is that they're on that little dial, you see that the, I've got the S highlighted. It's what they call shutter priority. I dial to shutter priority and what it allows me to do as a photographer, amateur photographer, is to set the shutter speed I want. How fast I want that shutter to, to open and close. The camera, the computer and the camera, the chip in the camera then takes care of everything else. It sets the aperture, it sets the sensitivity, it sets the white balance, it sets everything else for me. So I don't have to mess with all those other aspects of it. I just say, I want to speed up the shutter or I want to slow down the shutter and you take care of all the rest of the stuff for me. And it allows me a level of control to get something. The picture at the top and left, I just shot that behind the lodge here. I like the little waterfall there, it wasn't much, but you always like to see a little bit of blur in that water. You know, so I slowed down the shutter speed to a third of a second. You know, now, granted, that's the picture that came out pretty good. Uh, five or six other ones didn't come out at different shutter speeds, had different effects. But I did. I wasn't looking through 20 or 30. I did about three or four at different shutter speeds to get what I, to get the blur that I wanted. And the camera handled everything else for me. And you don't need a DSLR to do that. The point and shoots today, the good point and shoots also do that for you. So then we had a nice rain and uh, the water was puddling you know, on the blacktop and it had these little bubbles and the water was, you can kind of see the water pile, I don't know if you can see it or not, but the, kind of the drops were popping up. So I increased the shutter speed, speeded it up to 125, 125 of a second. And again, let the camera set the f-stop and the ISO and everything else. And I got some pictures of the water with the bubbles. Uh, Take a shot of a guy coming down a hill out west on a mountain bike. He was moving pretty fast. I kicked it up to 1 500th of a second because I knew I had to have a fast shutter to keep the motion from blurring. I wanted to get a sharp picture of that. And again, the camera did it for me. Now, one of the important aspects that we've learned in the camera group uh, about working with shutter speed is you need to figure out how slow a shutter speed you can hand hold. And typically, for example, what you're going to find is about a 60th of a second. The average person is good for about a 60th of a second. And the shutter speed that opens and closes in 1 60th of a second. Any slower than that, and most of us are going to get a little bit of wobble in it. And that is, that's the point where we need to put it on a monopod or a tripod. So you start you know, picking up devices like that. Um, 
I'm a tripod I use. I like the monopod. I got a really nice monopod. It's just the one thing. And it's got the peg. It works just like a walking stick. And, and I'll tell you, I paid big bucks for it. I got it at Walmart for $6.95. Um, it works great. Stick it on the camera, claps it up, shoot a little more. But you can, I can use it as a walking stick. I can stop and I can get a better shot. Now, it doesn't allow me to go as slow as a shutter speed as I could with a tripod, but it allows me to do better than a 60th of a second. And, and it's handy, it's not cumbersome to carry around. Uh, so working with shutter speed, probably the one aspect that most people, I know myself, had a lot of trouble wrapping their mind around is this whole thing of aperture, the aperture priority, or what we often hear referred to as f-stop. Fundamentally, what it has to do is how wide that lens opens up. Okay? And how wide the lens opens up determines what they call depth of field. How much of what you're shooting is in focus and how much of it is, is out of focus. Where the numbers get confusing is that the larger numbers actually have a smaller opening. And it, it's, you can understand it if you think of it this way. Suppose I was shooting at an f4. Think of that as a quarter and I upped it to an F8, well think of that as an eighth. An eighth is half the size of a quarter. Or if I went up to an F22, 1 22nd, okay? So the larger number actually means a smaller shutter. And the smaller shutter opening gets, the more of the picture that's in focus. So if you see in the example here, that F1.4, and the bird is gonna be in focus, but the tree behind it and the birds in front of it are gonna be out of focus. Now, you might be asking yourself, why do I care about that? Why does it matter? What we found is, suppose you're shooting this beautiful picture. I had a picture of, of, of a columbine out in Colorado, and a lot of flowers and stuff behind it. And I didn't want to confuse the picture with all those other flowers. Right? So going to a, a lower f-stop to reduce the depth of field, that flower was in, in focus, but the rest of it's kind of blurred, and you're focused, you really just see the flower. So I don't want that. In other situations, maybe I want everything in focus, so it's a matter of adjusting it to that. Uh, you can see where we get with the, uh, the 5.6 or, or the 22, get the whole thing in focus. And again, it's the same story. It's the same story that you have with the shutter priority issue. On today's cameras, you put it into this aperture priority. You set what you want in terms of what you'd like to see from depth of field aspect, what's in focus, what's not in focus, and let the camera <coughs> do all the other things for you. Sets the sensitivity, sets the white balance, uh, sets the shutter, the shutter speed, does everything else for you. So again, you don't have to be this you know, incredible you know, professional photographer who knows how to make, put all these studies together. You set the one that's going to give you the picture the way you want to see it, and let the camera do the rest of the work for you. This is an example of that. And you can see the different lenses starting from 1.4 up to, you can see the different openings of the lenses across the bottom. Uh, but if you take a look at it, the F1.8, the flower is in focus, but look at most of the rest is not in focus. But it allows your attention to be just on that flower. And as we step up, or as the lens size, the opening gets smaller and smaller, you see how more and more of the picture gets into focus. So again, it's a matter of looking at that and saying, what do I want? You know, what do I want to see? And uh, how do I get it? Exposure compensation. We just did a session last month on that. Uh, one of our members is a, uh, fortunately, is a professional sports photographer, and he did a great session for us on this thing called bracketing exposure compensation. Your camera, your camera takes a, take a picture of the camera, and it shoots what's called a, an exposure value of zero, zero. That's what the camera thinks. Based on its sensors, it thinks that's the right exposure. But if you kick it up a stop, or even a partial stop, you get a brighter picture. If you kick it down, you get a little darker picture. Now, you don't have to go a full amount. You can go thirds or halves on this. And the issue here is, like anything else, you can fine tune your camera. You may find that your camera actually gets a better picture if you kick up the compensation by maybe a third of a stop or a half a stop or if you kick it down a little bit. But the only way to find that out is to set something up, take a series of pictures, adjusting the exposure compensation and say, which one works best for my camera? Or if it's not just for your camera, which one works best for my eye? Which one do I like better? And then that situation, that's where I want to shoot. 
I want to make that adjustment so that I get the pictures that are more pleasing to me, and so that the photo looks the way I, I want it to look. But again, if you don't, the camera will do it for you, um, but it may not be exactly what you want or what you like. There's this thing on these cameras called program mode. Now you're looking at the DSLRs. Uh, and what the program mode does, and this is a phenomenal feature, is you can set, if we're looking at shutter speed, we're looking at the aperture, and this thing we haven't talked about yet, this ISO, which is the sensitivity, how sensitive the sensor is to, to light. I can set any one or two of these in program mode, and the camera will set the other one for me. So with the two free previous features, the shutter and the aperture, I set one thing, and it sets everything else. Here, I can set multiple things, and the camera's going to think, think, okay, I'll take care of the stuff you didn't bother with setting. So in this mode, for my sunset, I put it at 400th of a second, or I didn't, I, I just put, I just set the ISO <coughs> and let it take care of the shutter speed and the f-stop. On the um, street scene picture, this was across the street from, a, uh, oh God, what is it, uh, Luminati's down in Schaumburg by my daughters. Uh, I set the I, I set the uh, shutter speed and I set the ISO and let it take care of the f-stop. Then one evening there, the moon was looking nice out by our house, and so I set the f-stop and I set the ISO and let it take care of the shutter speed. And in the process, unbeknownst to me, I got a picture of Sun City's UFO. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know we had one, did you? It. it I mean, the moon is here. So I'm looking at this and saying, what the same was going on? Well, I belong to a, a, a group of retired faculty from the college where I taught, and, and each year we, we do a little camera contest, we take pictures, so I sent it off to all the, the, the retired faculty, and unfortunately, one of the retired faculty uh, is, the, is the gal who is the lead faculty member from our graphic design, said, did I get a UFO or what? And uh, Everybody pretty much agreed I got the UFO, except for Nancy, who was from the graphic design department, said, no, she's what you got is you got the moon reflection on your lens. <laughs> I still think it's a sounds like a UFO. <clears throat> but program mode. And again, if you don't know it's there, um, you know, you'll, you'll never use it. And, and, and it's, again, it's one of those things where, like I said, we don't have a bunch of pros in the camera group, but you've got people who've tried different things. You know, some of us have read, you know, maybe a third of the book <laughs> that, that, that thing about the thing and discovered stuff, and then share it. Say, have you tried this and try that and do that? Uh, again, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to change a lot of what you do. If I go to an event with my grandkids, I'm taking my little point and shoot, and I'm taking a bunch of different pictures, and I'm not worried about setting Stuff. I may even do a couple settings, but when I want to go out and take some serious pictures, you know, if I'm on vacation or something, really get something, then I'm going to work with this stuff. Uh, then you've got manual mode, and uh, this is this is where uh, you know your feet really hit the road on that. I took a shot, of, and this is where you set everything. Uh, I took the lodge one evening. Uh, I and mean, you can see what I set the uh, shutter speed, the ISO, and the f-stop at. Uh, I shot down uh, in front of the building at Christmas time. Uh, this was a shot back in Michigan before we moved here of, uh, of what, what do they call it, the uh, harvest moon, blood moon through the trees. Uh, just playing around with different settings. Again, it gives you a chance to work with those features of the camera if, you, if you're so interested. Uh, and, and get some unique shots, especially at nighttime. Okay, this thing we've talked about before, the ISO. Right? It basically what it relates to is the sensitivity of the lens. And the higher you set the number, the more the sensor is, not the lens, the sensor, the more sensitive the sensor is to light, which allows you to shoot in darker settings. And, and I found this, uh, this image out on the, uh, the net, I mean, you can find everything on the net. But I thought it was pretty good. It showed we were for ISO 100 to 800. I don't know if you can see it real well, but as you go down, the picture gets grainier and grainier. The camera people talk about it as noise. You know, to me, it's just the picture gets grainier and you, and you don't have as good of an image. However, the ISO gives you the ability 
uh, even without getting dirty, to do some better shots in the dark. The, uh, the wine glass, or the cocktail glass, uh, at, at different ISOs. And you can see how it improves as we increase the ISO to a picture where I'm actually getting the shot that I want, um, being able to adjust that to handle uh, a darker setting or to deal with, you know, when you want more, more light. Um, you know, maybe your shoe, we went to, um, when I should have done ISO, and, and again, you can see I'm still in the learning phase, because I say often say, what I should have done. Uh, at, at my uh, grandson's, the play he was in, everybody up on the station, I should have, I should have increased ISO, because as I'm looking at the pictures, I don't really have good shots. I'm sitting back in the audience looking at up on the stage, and if I had ramped that ISO up a little bit to make the, sen the sensor a little more sensitivity, a little more sensitive, I would have gotten a lot better pictures of the play going on on the stage. So it's just a matter, it's not a, only a matter of learning that those things are there and learning how to set them, but then getting it in your mind as to when to, when to do that. Uh, so I wound up with a lot of nice pictures of the play, but not the ones I wanted, not what I was seeing. White balance. This one always kills me. It's nothing to do with white, but colors. Uh, in terms of how you go from, it's a Kelvin scale, how you go from the blues, from the cools to, to the warms. Okay, and again, nice thing about the cameras is they have predefined settings for you under certain situations. So if you're cloudy, if it's, uh, you know, if it's shady, if it's uh, fluorescent light versus incandescent light, you can change that white balance. Um, you can let the camera do it automatically but again, the camera doesn't always pick up the best setting for you. So you can set it, if you know, if, if I'm shooting under incandescent lights, I'll change it to that. If I'm shooting under fluorescent lights, I'll do that. If you're in the shade or the shadow. And what it does is it simply tries to adjust along that Kelvin scale between a warm and a cool image. And you can actually use this to get some interesting things. Here's a shot out of the lake, okay? One leaning towards the cool, and one leaning towards the warm. Exact same picture, simply shot at different white balances. And what it does <coughs> is it allows you to get the picture or the image you want. Do I like it better in the cooler, or do I like it better in the warmer? Um, making that setting, again, like I said, gives me the ability to <coughs> get what I want out of it. Metering. Metering is an interesting feature of the camera. And we just recently looked at that last month. I, don't, I think a lot of us didn't even know it was there. Typically, most of your cameras will have three levels of metering, what they call matrix or, um, I forget what the other term is, Canon calls it something, Nikon calls it matrix, Canon calls it something else, it's the same thing, center weighted and spot. When the camera, when you point the camera at a shot, it tries to detect the exposure compensation, the brightness. And if you have it in matrix, it uses the entire frame to do that. Now I know on my camera, there are 420 zones. And it uses all 400 of those 20 zones, looks at them, and tries to figure out what the com how light or dark the picture should be, what the compensation should be, based on what it sees. If I change it to center weighted, what it's going to do is it's going to only look at that center portion of it, and it's going to get the readings out of that. Uh, so I can I can get the Justin or if you go to spot get into that so you say where do I use that well suppose you're shooting a, a performer on a stage you know maybe maybe um, you know maybe uh, you know one of your grandkids is up there in the band concert and they're playing a solo and you want to focus just on them you know so if you set it to spot and focus right on them you're going to get a great you know it's going to pick up the light of them and not worry about the rest of the <coughs> stage so again it's the ability to make an adjustment to get that camera to to focus in on, on something specific, like just a person or a little larger area or the whole thing, to be able to get the image that you want and, and so you can see what you want. Lenses, now oh, this is always a, an issue. I took five shots down to the lodge and uh, about 180 feet uh, from the sign, the fountain view, and that's just a step on, and then took it at uh, 18 millimeters, 55, 100, and, and 200. Focal length, the distance from the lens to the where the camera focuses. And you can see what, what that does for me just in terms of bringing the picture in closer and closer and closer. Uh, the, the human eye runs right, or, right around 50, or about a 50 on the focal length. Uh, and what this does is it gives us the ability to get the close-ups that we want. Um, I remember years ago back in, uh, geez, it was 99, uh, I'm an old ex-off-roader, and we went to Camp Jeep down in um, 
Blue Ridge Mountains, and, and they always did these sessions for us. Um, I think we had a we had a session where we learned to juggle. We had a session by the guy from Duncan Yo-Yo, and there was a photography session there uh, done by a guy from National Geographic. And uh, so he's going to do this photography session with all these off-roaders who have a camera and don't have a clue as to what they're doing. And he said, I'm, I'm going to improve your picture taking by 200% in just two things. He said, the first 100% is going to become the time of day when you shoot. And he said, there's this thing called the golden hour. And he said, I know. It's the hour, you know, the hour right after sunrise and the hour just before sunset. Not everybody's getting up in those hours <laughs> and trying to shoot that. But he said, if you, if you shoot your pictures before 10 o'clock in the morning or after 5 o'clock in the evening, he said, you're going to get better color on that. Doesn't mean you can't shoot in the middle of the day, but you're going to get better pictures because it's this thing called color saturation. He said, your pictures will improve 100% if you do that. He said, the second thing is, then when you line up your picture to take it, don't take it. Cut the distance in half and then take it. And he said, either do it by physically getting there or by zooming, zooming in on the camera. He said, I guarantee you, your pictures are going to improve another 100% if you get a little bit closer. Well, today, you know, we don't need to walk closer. We can, we can do it with the lenses and they're, they're affordable. The one thing, that I've learned uh, from my point and shoot camera that you've got to be very careful of with point and shoot cameras. Is point and shoot cameras have both optical zoom and digital zoom. Now what you see here is pure optical zoom. All right? And what that means is all through the lens, the lens handles the zoom, and the, the level of resolution and the sharpness of the picture is going to be the same at every step along the way. So if I'm shooting something with a camera that goes from 55 to 300, my resolution and my sharpness is going to be the same from 55 all the way to 300. But if I have a point and shoot camera that gives me digital zoom, what that does is to zoom in, it actually does a modification of the picture in the camera. What it does is it takes the picture, and we'll get to this, it crops it down. So in other words, it reduces it to be a smaller part of the picture, it just takes the edges off, and then it blows up what's left to make it look bigger. Well, it does get bigger, but what happens is the resolution and the sharpness degrade. Uh, so if you have a camera that has both digital and optical, you want to be attuned to that. Uh, one of the things that, that I've discovered on my little pocket fishing camera is it's got a little bar. And when, that, when, when it goes from yellow to blue, I know it's in the digital zoom. And what I tend to want to do is back up to the optical. Even though it might get me a little closer, the picture gets progressively worse as I get it more and more into that, that, that digital zoom. All right, I'd like to talk about shooting techniques. And again, this is one of the things that the uh, photo group has been looking at, just different techniques to get different types of pictures. Um, shooting a blur. And if you think back, shooting a blur is accomplished by, give me a hint, shutter speed. Yeah, shutter speed. So the top picture uh, is, is what's called a, um, a zoom blur. You, you simply set your camera on the tripod, tripod, you pick your image, you're going to set the shutter speed, I set it, I set it here to four tenths of a second, and you just zoom in. And with, with the camera on the tripod, you just, as the, when the while the shutter's open, you just turn the lens to zoom right in, and you get that kind of a, a tunnel effect. Yet ideally, if you do it really well, I didn't do it really well, the, the center flower <laughs> stays in focus, so you get kind of an interesting picture on that. Um, this was a shot I did with my point and shoot, my, my grandson's um, Taekwondo class, and I wanted just to get an idea of the motion, the group, and so again, setting it at, at a third of the second, uh, again, with shutter priority, it gave me that, that feel of motion. Some people don't like those pictures, you know, and that's the, if you don't like them, you don't take them. You know, maybe you like a little bit of blur on the waterfall or something of that nature, but I, I kind of enjoyed, you know, just to get a feel for the motion. Or if you're shooting a race car or with somebody going by on a mountain bike or whatever, again, being able to uh, get that picture so that the car is in focus and the background will be out of focus. That's the tough one to do. That, that's the one that, I'm still trying to master because what you have to do is you have to move the camera. Okay, so you, you have to track, you know, maybe, 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 you know, if you really want to get good at this, you join the um, sportsman's club and the shotgun group or something. <laughs> you, get, you get good at tracking the image 
And the better you do a job of that, then the object's going to be in focus and the background's going to be out of focus. But again, it's techniques. Using the features of the camera, learning to use the features of the camera, and then learning the techniques to get the image the way you want to see it. I want to see the car. And, and again, the neat thing about getting the background in the blur is you also get a sense of motion. Because this is a 2D image. I don't care what you know. It's just two-dimensional. So it, it kind of gives me that issue, that, that idea of speed or of motion because I see that background in the blur. High dynamic range. We've just started to play with this in the photo group. And, and this is an interesting, really interesting feature of, of photography. I've got a lot of pictures that I took out in the San Juan Mountains where I spent a lot of time. And what I have is I have a really nice mountain picture where this part of it is really great and this part's all washed out. Or I have a part where this portion of it is really good and this is so dark you can't see it. The camera is going to pick a sensing level and I'm not going to get a good shot of either. But what HDR does is HDR allows you to put the images together. So what I have is I have a overexposed where you see the foreground <laughs> on the bottom is in good contrast. And then I take another one that's underexposed and now I've got the sun that I want in it. And it's through either in the camera or through software and, and that allows me to put the two together and get the best of both. Okay? Sure, it's a combined picture, but it's my picture. You know? And, and in essence, let's see, this thing goes back. In essence, it gives me what I actually saw. This is what I saw. But when I shot with the camera, <laughs> these are what it took. So the ability to put it together and, and get the picture that I saw or the image that I wanted in that respect. <coughs> Light painting. This is on our schedule of events to take a look at. It's a, it's a lot of fun, interesting to do. It's at night. Uh, it, it involves a camera, a tripod, and a flashlight. <laughs> and um, I, I shouldn't admit it, but uh, I will. It took me a long time. How on the sand hill do you get the camera to focus on something when it's pitch dark? You turn on the damn flashlight. <laughs> when you do that, <laughs> then you get it focused, turn the flashlight off, set the camera to delay, and then take your flashlight and paint the part of the picture you want painted. And there it goes. And if you're really good, if you're really good, do it against the mirror and learn to write backwards. You can write words <laughs> with the light. Not something I'm gonna do. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's see, back up. Okay, enough on the camera. Let's talk a little bit about photo manipulation. Um, mm. We have the CASA in the lab. Doesn't cost you anything to use it. All you got to do is come to the lab. And, <coughs> but let me let me uh, suggest one thing. Take the class. <laughs> you know, if you really want to make use of the software, take the class and find out how to use it because it gives us the ability to take pictures. Many pictures that we take are opportunistic, and they aren't quite what we want. But you would believe you wouldn't believe. In software, we can manipulate those. We can sharpen the brightness. We can change the shadows. We can enhance the contrast. We can do stuff to make a mediocre <coughs> picture a really nice looking picture if you have the software and if you have the ability to do it. Picasso is a great package. It's in the lab. It's free download too, right? We can, you can get it for free for your own camera. Um, a software I've been using is uh, Photoshop Elements. You know, I'm, I'm Creative Suite's a little too rich for my blood pressure, but Elements you can get it for 69 bucks, and it allows me to do layers and show you some of the things with that. Uh, one of the softwares that uh, a couple of our members have played with for the HDR is this uh, Photo Matrix Pro, which uh, it's, a, it's a little more pricey, but $99, but still, you can get stunning images out of it. So the software is out there, and I thought, we, we look at that in the group, we're going to be looking at that, so let's take a look at some of the software manipulation things. Uh, like I said, I'm going to focus on Picasa, which we have, three download classes, and then Photoshop Elements. The new, newest version is 13. All right. In our uh, this camera group from the college, one of the pictures we had to take from one of our contests was a self-portrait, and I put the camera on a tripod, set the delay timer, run around, <laughs> get in front of it. Um, so my self-portrait, and then I a texture. You can get texture. So I took a shot of a barn wood. And then through uh, Photoshop Elements, put the two together. 
and you get an interesting effect. Like I said, it may, it may not be anything that, that piques your interest, but if you're so inclined, you can get some interesting stuff with that. Uh, another one, that's the Yankee Girl lift station up in Red Mountain. I went out on the internet, found the old mining map from Red Mountain, and again, through overlays, put the two together. You know, not, not the greatest picture, but it's kind of interesting, and you can do some interesting things with that. So I've got the, the Yankee Girl lift station, and then I've got the Red Mountain mining map as an overlay on it. Learning to use the software to do that. More commonly, what you're gonna do, uh, maybe you want black and white. The cameras have black and white. They have a, a monochrome mode you can dial in and choose black and white. My understanding is, at least from what some of the members in the club have told me, is you actually get a better black and white picture if you convert a color image to black and white in either Picasso or Elements or some software. It'll actually do a better job than the camera does. But this was a shot uh, with the camera in monochrome mode. Um, and then here's a shot where I simply had a picture of, what do you call it, paper bark maple? I think they're going to call it. Anyway, on the backyard, and then just moved it over in elements to, to black and white. So if you have aspirations of being the next Ansel Adams or something, <laughs> um, I think black and white's kind of cool. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an era where I still at night enjoy the old black and white Perry Masons. But. <laughs> Photo cropping. Oh, this this is this has probably got to be, in my mind, one of the greatest features. Sure, you can do it in the camera, but you can do it better in software. I took a picture of my granddaughter, that's how I was, we got her a cowgirl hat, and you see she wasn't real pleased with the hat. And I took the picture, and like so many pictures, I got more in the picture than I wanted. The ability to go into the software and crop it down, you can see where the crop line is, and get just the image I want. I don't want to see so much of the picture on the wall, and I don't want to see as much of the sofa, I want to see Isabel. <laughs> and to be able to crop that down and, and get that image, um, gives me exactly what I want in respect to it. So cropping is such a cool feature and learning to do it. And if you take if you take a class in Picasso here, you're gonna learn how to do that. You know, it's it's not hard to learn on your own, but it's also nice to have somebody, you know, show you how to do it. Adjusting brightness. Asian Lily. Uh, yeah, I could do it with camera exposure, but back then I didn't know camera exposure even existed, thanks to the camera group I do now. <laughs> But uh, shot my picture, thought it was a bit dark, put it into the software, and again, again either Picasso or Photoshop products, and lightened it up. Lightened it up to my taste. Now, now some people might have liked the darker image better. I liked the brighter image better. And again, the picture that didn't quite meet my expectations, I was able to take in the software and adjust it to, to get the image that I wanted out of it. Softwares give you the ability to do collages, okay? I, I made myself a collage, it was just pump them in, pick the collage feature and pump them in. Uh, old mine sites out in the San Juan Mountains, uh, this was down at, uh, I don't know, what was it, the Huntley Fall? I don't know, they had the classic car thing. So I got in there, taken all the, the badges from the cars and, and it just stuck them together. Again, if it's not something that, that you know, turns your crank, you don't do it, but the features are there in the software, it gives you the ability uh, to put collages together. Selective color. I always kind of thought this was a cool feature. You can do it in the camera, but you can do it better uh, in, in software. This ability to take a full color picture and pick one color. I just picked the red flag. This was, out, this was at the uh, Stanley Hotel. They have a collection of old antique fire engines there together. I think they're up to three now. So I took that old fire engine and then the ability just to go in and say, I just want the, um, the bubble red and the rest of them black and white. What, what, the picture I've seen of this some things that look really cool is you see pictures with um, a black and white image of, of a woman and all she's got is the red lipstick. Uh, or, or I think one of the neatest ones I saw was the old, was it the old Oldsmobiles that had the uh, hood ornament that lit up, kind of amber, being able to take the hood of that car and then just have the only thing that was lit was that, that, that hood ornament. Was it, was it old or? Pontiac, okay, yeah, okay, but it just it makes a really it just jumps out at you, you know. Like I said, it's not something you do with every picture, but the ability to make some unique pictures in that respect. Uh, I don't get this one at all, but it's there. Fish eye. I don't know why you'd want to do a fish eye, but you can do. You can buy a fish eye lens, I guess. I mean, the camera group said those were available, but uh, it's there. Uh, this is the one that I wind up using more often than not. You know, my hand held the picture and I thought I was straight and, you know, it wasn't. So you put it into the software, straighten it up, but then you've got to crop it, otherwise you've got a funny looking picture. 
so you get a little lens, but it also gets me a little closer. But the ability to take those pictures that are a little bit cockeyed and, and, and straighten them up, you know, much, much nicer image. Red eye, oh yeah. <laughs> And way back then, he red eye, and it just you know, in the camera, in Picasso, in the in the Elements project, just to get that red eye out of there. Probably not as wind up, doesn't wind up as being as good a shot as if you'd have been able to avoid it in the first place. But again, the ability to to eliminate it so you don't have a kid sitting there looking like Damien or something. <laughs> the photo group meets the second Monday of each month at seven o'clock in the computer lab. Um, you know, like anything else, you need to pick a time, you pick a day. It doesn't work for everybody. Right now we're at about 16 members. We'd like to see it increase. Uh, we did our organizational meeting in November. This was uh, one of those deals where uh, when we moved here, we joined the computer club. I went over to George and said, hey, George, do, do, do you have a photography? Because I, I realized there were special interest groups. Uh, my wife joined the um, so-and-sos and she discovered there's a machine embroidery group that, you know, so I, I said, hey, so I asked Jerry, said, do you have a photo group? He said, well, you know, we used to, you know, a long time ago. It's kind of gone by the wayside. But he said, we well, can have it again if somebody will take some leadership. <laughs> and thanks, George. <laughs> so we did our organizational meeting in November. And what we decided we're going to do is for every meeting we have, we're going to look at something and see the present. It's typically a presentation by one of our members something they've been working with or something they're familiar with, just to kind of and share the information. And uh, so what we decided at organizational meeting is we were gonna do a Christmas train shoot. So we came down when they put the trains in the thing and, and we just kind of looked at what it might take to do that. It was just kind of loosely knit at that point. And we did a, a tour. So we're trying to follow up every meeting with a shoot. Uh, then we, our December meeting, we specifically looked at shooting Christmas decorations. Uh, and we took decoration shoots around the community and the thing. Uh, discovered that there's a thing out there called, uh, from one of our members, called a, a star filter. And I guess you can get a four point, a six point, an eight point. It's a little filter you screw on your lens, and when you shoot the Christmas tree lights or any lights, you get that little star effect. Now, one of our guys said you can do the same thing with a piece of screen. I haven't tried it, but he said just hold up a piece of screen, you know, a metal window screen in front of it, and you get that effect. We did that. Uh, and then when we have the meeting, what we do is they send, they send the pictures in and we show them this meeting. So we show what our members have shot. And, uh, and it's one of those things where you've got to learn to be willing to submit the crappy picture you took. Because you can learn as much from a crappy picture as a good picture. Here's what I did, and here's why it didn't work. <laughs> you know, here's where I screwed up. Um, you know, not just the good ones and bad ones. Last one was by Don on, on the, uh, the EV and bracketing. Uh, Monday's group, and you're all welcome to, and been love if we fill the computer lab and overflow. Uh, Don Kelly, who's uh, in the pencil and palette club, I believe, he's doing one on composition for us. And uh, he's going to do an interesting thing with shapes, and we're going to create a look at, at composition. And then we'll all have an assignment to shoot some pictures trying to, you know, get the composition. Com composition. composition is, in my mind, probably one of the biggest uh, areas of difficulty for me. It's seeing the picture. You know, what should I shoot? You know, uh, I'm still at a point where I'll shoot a lot of pictures and hope I get the right angle, the right thing, but how do I see what I'm looking for? And you start to look at stuff like railroad tracks or lines or different, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, the camera helps you with that thing called rule of thirds. It puts the grid on your camera so you know not to put the thing right in the middle, to put it to the side. But we're going to look at composition and then we're going to shoot some pictures and share them in the following month on, on that. Um, so what I'd like to do is just quickly, I just, what I have here are pictures that members have sent in things. So in essence, I feel we have permission to share. They share it with the camera club. The camera club's part of the computer club. So I'll show you some of the pictures of some of our members took a train shoot. Uh, this was done with a uh, slower speed to get the motion of the train coming around the corner. Uh, Very nice, very nice pictures, you know. And uh, and they always communicate what they do, what they shoot at. You can see where the exposure was up or not, to the, what the f-stop or, or aperture was, the focal length, the speed, the ISO, the flash was on or off. So that information. So we're, what we're doing is we're simply learning from what each other has done and what makes a good and an interesting picture. That was that was from the uh, that was from the train shoot. Then our Christmas decoration shoot. 
Now, Reg is in Florida. <laughs> and rub it in. And this was from our bracketing. We back remember the bracketing, and we where you take it and overcome, overexposed, underexposed, and then we put them together in HDR. Uh, <coughs> this was obviously one of our members who was down in Florida. You can see what he did in terms of the. Uh, this is what the camera did right here, just in his natural state. Then he brought it down. He brought the exposure up and put them together into that image. And this was done with. Uh, photo matrix. You can see the photo matrix on it because he's working from the trial version, so it puts his little logo on there. If he's not too cheap and buys it, he, that won't be there. <laughs> this one was one of our members out in Arizona. He was uh, on a hike. So again, here's what the camera shot. He brought it down to, brought it up to, put them together in that image. This was what he saw. Okay. This is what the camera saw. So he forced it to look at this and to look at this. And then when he put those together, he got the image that he saw. So don't fool yourself. The camera won't necessarily take the picture you see. You have to be able to make it do that. Future programs, we're going to look at how to shoot with a blur. Um, we have a commitment uh, from our one member who was a former professional sports photographer in, uh, in May to do a, uh, a workshop for us on uh, sports photography, which means, you know, to me, better shots at the kids' karate matches, better shots at the grandkids' soccer games, you know, maybe I'll even go down to the uh, ball field and get some good shots of the softball players. Uh, we want to look at portraits, we want to look at night shots and photo painting landscape. We have one member who's taking classes in video, and one of the things I didn't mention, these DSLR, DSLR cameras have phenomenal video capability in them, so we want to start looking at what we can do with video. Uh, we also want to look at softwares in terms of overlays, textures, dynamic ranges. So that, again, the group is uh, just your fellow computer club members, not professional amateurs, we're just trying to learn from each other. But uh, I, I think we're all getting better. You know, the more you figure it out, and, and even if you say, I should have done that, you, next time maybe you'll remember to do it. Oh, yeah. So that box is the pictures. Early on, I found them, I because we moved where I got them. I know where they are. Uh, what do I do with them? Well, systematically, I'm gonna go through them, get the good ones, I'm gonna bring up the computer lab, and I'm gonna scan them. Um, I already, try, already tried out their 35 millimeter slide thing. That's great. Put 12 pictures in there, throw it in the machine, let it do its thing, and I've got a nice uh, digital image of each one of the, the slides, you know. And then, of course, they weren't that great from back when I took them with my, my old 35. So now I'll put them in elements and <laughs> improve the brightness and, and have some, you know, pretty decent pictures. Um, you know, it's, it's always the issue of I don't know what you do. You get these digital pictures, and it's kind of like slides. You know, they're all there, you got them, but how, how do you get out and look at them? Uh, one of the things that, that we've done, uh, and it just it, it works for us, is we bought a nice uh, <coughs> digital frame, and the digital frame that takes a thumb drive, flash drive, and so you put them on that and put it in there, and, and the pictures you just saw, you're on the table in, in the living room or in the den, it just goes through the pictures. And so we've got, we've got, a, we've got one from our travel pictures, we've got one from the grandkids, we've got one from you know, just wildflowers and stuff, so you can change them out, and so you always got something, you know, it works out real nice. And uh, then when the kids come down, we can force them to, <laughs> we, we, got, we got them last year, we, we found the old projector and we hauled up the box of slides and said, at Christmas time, they were all together at our condo up in Michigan, and we said, boy, we got a treat for you guys. Well, <laughs> you know, it wound, it wound up being a real treat for the grandkids. Because my son and my daughter were sitting there going, oh my God, look at that. And my grandkids were saying, that's mom? That's dad? <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you. And, and please join us uh, Monday if you want to. You need to bring a pair of scissors and you need to bring some scotch tape <laughs> if you come Monday. Uh, we're going to do some things with shapes uh, to help us better understand composition. So again, thank you for your attention. I would just like to say that we uh, really thank uh, Jeff for his 
amount of time he spent putting that together. Because anybody that knows uh, doing a PowerPoint, you know that he did an excellent job. Any questions? I, I have two comments. Uh, one, there's another uh, uh, software package that's uh, Windows, Microsoft's Windows Lab Photo Gallery. It's also free. Uh, it does an excellent job as well. And it, it's a free download. Um, and the other thing is, um, he talked a lot about uh, f-stops and, and shutter speeds. The thing for you to do is to go home and sit with your camera at your leisure. Don't wait until you're out and you're gonna wanna take that great shot. Go home, sit there, play with the camera, learn how to use all the different settings, and then go out and take some nice pictures. Well, let me interject just something on that. Uh, Windows Live Photo Gallery. When, when club members send me pictures, I always pull them up in Windows Live Photo Gallery because if you open up the property, you go to File and open up Properties, and scan out, it will show you what the shutter speed was, what the aperture was, what the exposure compensation was. So you can not only, if you take those pictures, you can bring them up in the live gallery and go to properties, and you can actually see what, what you've got. Uh, one of the neat things from those scene modes, is take a shot with the landscape scene, take a shot with the portrait scene, put it in live, and take a look and see what the camera did. And it'll give you an idea where a starting point might be for those pictures in those respects. Okay, any questions uh, for Jeff? Well, he just answered it. Okay, what are the things he said uh, about the uh, looking for exposure information? You can look at Picasso, if people have taken that class. If you just look over in the lower right hand section of the edit screen, it has uh, an info tab. And the info tab will show all those settings that he's talking about. So. Any questions? software are you yeah you know, you gotta get into a uh, take Picasso and yes a lot better it will come into the lab sometime we'll talk about this that one issue okay one more question last question here for okay yeah you said the export okay here's here's some little tip for you here if you do have a tripod and a camera, put the camera on the tripod and start fooling around with it rather than uh, trying to hold it. You can do a lot, learn a lot more if you put it on the tripod and do all these uh, adjustments. Yeah, surely uh, the shape, especially in those handheld cameras, the small ones you, with the viewer on the back that don't have a rangefinder. You're going to hold them out from your, you're going to hold them out. So get in the habit of looking at it out there to see it and bring it back in so you're, you're holding it closer to your chest. And then take the picture because when you hold it out here, it's going to move up and down a lot. Well, I can look up the properties on my tells me when I We'll see you next month. What we have to do then on that.